so welcome to Tamara's Closet today. I have uh, with me a very, very special artist from Pretoria, South Africa, and he is a master artist, so it's really a, an honor today to have him here with me. And uh, he started sketching in primary school, and he's also a musician, and he started the trumpet at age six. And by the time he reached high school, he knew he was destined to become an artist and a musician. So I always love it when I find out somebody is multi-talented, because that just makes it even more fun, more exciting. So I'm really excited to have him here today. He is known for his striking interpretation of moody or turbulent skies, and his work is in collections all over the world. So I'm going to have him talk about that today. I want to go ahead and bring him out, though. So I want to give a warm welcome to master artist Koos Bronhorst. Say hello, Koos, so I know you're still with me. Hi, everybody. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's had a busy day already, so I just thought that um, it's nice that he can chill out a minute with me here, or a few minutes. So, Coos, I, really, I really am excited. It really is an honor to have you here today, and I want you to talk a little bit about your childhood first, because you started really, really young. And I wanted to know what your first memory of art that, say, that was an inspiration to you, because you did start so young, but do you remember what inspired you or sparked your interest as in art at all? Yes, it was uh, mostly my late father. He, uh, he, was a, he was also a musician, and he was a, a part-time painter. He didn't paint all that much. He never went into it very serious, but he knew the materials. He was uh, uh, the kind of person who believed that uh, you need to know how to use the tools that you're working with, and uh, he had the same approach with art as what he had with music. And uh, he inspired me, or he showed me uh, pictures, images, and uh, articles on different artists, and uh, their work and we used to uh, sometimes discuss this and uh, also with the music he, uh, he had us going from very young he used to sit at the piano and uh, play certain things and we had to sing and later on learn how to harmonize and all that so even before we went to school we had to learn those things wow now was your mother an artist of any sort or my mother uh, was from Irish descent, and uh, she wasn't uh, 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 into fine art or anything, but she was very creative. She knitted, and we were a very big family. We were eventually nine children, and she knitted all our knit, uh, uh, knitwear and our winter clothes, jerseys, and so forth that she knitted. And she also played the piano accordion. So we were used to music and creativity, art, everything, uh, even as far as gardening and landscaping uh, was concerned. Uh, my father taught us these different things. We were still very young when we first cast a slab of cement and uh, learned how to do lay on water pipes for plumbing and uh, put a fountain in the middle and then built uh, a nice fish pond. And around this fish pond, he had all these plants growing, you know. And uh, in winter, the fine spray would actually freeze on the plants. And what intrigued me the most was the reflection and the light on the ice early morning. I remember newspaper uh, uh, people coming to our house to take photographs of, of, of the pond. And, and that was one of, also, to me, that was something beautiful, and all my life I've been trying to capture this kind of light. Wow, so what was it? They sprayed on the pond? Because I couldn't hear what you, you broke up a little bit. Okay, uh, pardon, what are you asking about? What was it? You said they sprayed, she sprayed something on the pond, and then it reflected no. the light? Yeah, in the center of this fish pond that we built, Built. It was above ground, and in the center of it, there was this pipe coming out with, that emitted a very fine spray. 
Okay. Water, water spray. And that uh, gathered, on, uh, of course, on top of the plants and froze as it landed on the plants. So we would have all these plants encased in ice. And, of course, the sun come, came up and uh, then start melting it. And you would see different kinds of light and, and sunlight reflected and that kind of thing. And that really intrigued me. I could sit for hours watching this. Wow. So you were a natural. I mean, you to notice that so young, you know, and be intrigued by light, um, you know, that, that, no wonder you're a master artist here. But <laughs> yeah. uh, well, well, you know, I, uh, I refrain from calling myself a master artist because there are simply so many uh, facets in, in, in art that I think a person can probably in one lifetime perhaps master uh, one little bit and then uh, concentrate on that. But of course, artists are very uh, inquisitive people and we, we're we always aware of what's going around on around us and what we see. And we try and copy nature, but not just copy nature, uh, try to interpret what we see and what we feel. It's like uh, Claude Monet had, had, had actually and an and eye problem, and this is uh, evident in his paintings. And now in later years, people could actually see from the colors and the, uh, the way he painted, they could actually pick up that he actually had this eye defect. And yet look what beautiful artworks he created. So nobody else could really have painted like that because we couldn't see like him. Right. And so, and so are all of we, you know, we, we, we see things differently and we experience uh, uh, the feeling of different scenes and views around us. There's, there's different things that attract our attention. Exactly. Well, now, you, did your siblings, because you had a large, you have a lot of siblings, did, are any of them, did they continue on with art or is it just mainly you? Now my, my older brother, he, he's, uh, he became a musician, he's actually a classical guitar player and a flautist and then later on went to study theology, so he still plays part-time, uh, you know, and he practices very hard. His son, of course, is also taking up the classical guitar and my youngest son, Nick, is uh, uh, interested in painting, but he doesn't get to spend much time with it. Right. And, uh, I suppose this is the essence of the whole thing. It has to become a passion and we need to cover as much canvas as we can and spend a lot of time. Whatever we achieve doesn't come for free. It's very hard work. Exactly. Well, you're right. And it does come. And when it's a passion, it's, it's still, I know it's still work, but it's not, it's different. You know, when it's a passion, you want to do passion it. Is. Yeah. So no, it, you enjoy, or enjoy doing it, of course, then uh, always prepare to spend more time with it. And that doesn't mean that we're not uh, uh, critical of ourselves. And uh, whatever we do is, I think even now, uh, probably at least half of my paintings I reject. Wow. Well, your work is stunning. I, I really, really, it's just beautiful. And you are a master artist and that you've been, you were highly recommended by the artist in your, in South Africa, who aren't even in your area. So uh, <laughs> no. you, you are regarded as a master artist. So, I, but I want to, in your bio, you mentioned learning the basics from your father. Um, but was he the main influence, or do you remember? Was there any anybody else that influenced you when you were really, really young? Even another artist, or yes, I used to see, uh, uh, you know, uh, prints and paintings of John Constable, the British artist, and uh, Reynolds, and a few others, you know, and then also some of the masters, the old masters. Uh, and I started reading up on them and I saw that, in fact, a lot of them that did portraits, uh, they, 
the, the landscape background was actually painted by other artists who learned in their studios. That was actually the apprentices. And this fascinated me. And uh, I decided to focus on, on, on landscapes at first, only on landscapes. Uh, I don't think one can ever master it. It's just that one develops your own approaches, techniques. And of course, there are a lot of rules and uh, um, that are there to be broken. I think most of them have been broken. One really needs to know what you're doing if you're going to start pushing against the rules. My dad supplied me with a, uh, uh, <coughs> pardon me, a, a book on perspective by a guy called Rex Cole. And to me, this looked like a, 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 a maths book. And I, I didn't like maths at all. So, <laughs> I never paid much attention to it. I learned uh, about perspective enough to stay out of trouble, and that's all. <laughs> well, you are, uh, I mean, you started so young, and I, I was curious as to, did your, did your parents, how, how did they first recognize that you really had a special gift? And they obviously were supportive because your father encouraged you. Yes, you know, they used to, some. Uh, uh, actually my older brother was the first one, he used to start, uh, he would take a picture that I, that I did, you know, just sat down and scratched the picture and uh, one day I came in here and he uh, slipped it into an old frame and it was hanging on the wall and I was quite surprised by this and I said to him, how can you hang this on the wall? <laughs> and he yeah. said to me, it's a beautiful picture. And my dad also liked it and it was very impressionistic. And uh, I was very young still, but uh, uh, I had broken up the, uh, the, the colors into uh, the harmonies and used little spots to paint the picture uh, almost something between impressionist and, and, and pointillism. And uh, I was very small. I really enjoyed doing that. And that is what actually tickled me and it fired me up. But of course, uh, uh, my life took a different path at certain stages where I had to decide uh, how I'm going to make a living. And uh, then I started working hard on the music part of it. And uh, uh, I later on uh, joined different bands and uh, I made, made a, good, uh, a fairly good living from, art, uh, from, from music. And um, it was only in later years, uh, I was very young still, I was only 27 years old when I ended up in a clinic for uh, alcoholism. And uh, it was when I was released from this clinic. And uh, I, I felt that I've got a new life. And, and I was really very ecstatic and, and, and euphoric, you know. So I really wanted just to do nice things and to, to create things. I wanted to really do something. And uh, that's what really tickled me and set me off. Wow, so you were young when you went through that. You, I, I'm gonna have you talk about that a little bit more um, too, because I want that. That's an important part of your life, and yes. so I want to get back to that. But I want you to tell the story, um, Coos, uh, because I read in your bio uh, the the story about the little treasure chest that you made when you were going through your father's things. Was it was an ammunition box or something? Oh yes, that was when I was released from the clinic and uh, I was in a bathroom and uh, there was always this little uh, box, uh, not very big, it, used, it had some divisions in it and a couple of drawers and uh, it was, uh, in fact, a Second World War ammunition box. It was made from some type of wood. I think it was Oregon pine. And my father had painted this box white. So my father had passed away in the meanwhile. And uh, this was part of, of his belongings that came to me afterwards. Uh, I, this box had been standing there always. I'd never opened it. And, wow, uh, okay. No, it was just standing there, and I opened the box, and inside I found all these tubes of paint. 
some of them were very old and it was a, a really good uh, a professional quality paint but there, there was no white and of course a person need a bit of white uh, at least to, to mix colors with and so I went and bought a tube of white and I realized gee whiz I've got a fortune with a paint here and that's when I really started working with oil instead of just with uh, with uh, charcoal and pencil and uh, watercolor and that kind of thing. So that really triggered me and uh, I I was very happy about it and I, I still remember it as if it was yesterday and uh, I think that probably was my uh, kickstart, you know. Yeah, did you keep this little treasure box or like, like yes, is it memory? After, afterwards, I, I found out, in fact, my, my older brother, but then he said to me that this box was actually left to him by my dad. My dad had actually given it to him before he passed away. And um, so I don't have the box anymore. It's in Willem's house and it's been restored beautifully. Unfortunately, I don't have, yet, have it yet. I could show you. But it's just a, you know, a nice little material reminder of where I was then and what I needed to do, uh, which the art became part of my recovery. And uh, it really put me in a better place. Whenever I was uh, uh, not so well mentally, I would uh, get busy with my paints and I would be in a different world. Right. But I, I was reading as a master artist, you're, you know, and I know there's lots of different definitions, but you, you're a, a master of color, of technique. And I wanted to know how, how did you learn about color? What, what could you tell others about how, how you learned about color? And because you're obviously, I mean, when I look at your work, the, it is it's just beautiful and i wish i know you don't have a lot with it today but you can is there something you can tell is there how you learn because it sounds like you were self-taught for the most part yes well uh, nobody's really self-taught it's more a, <laughs> a, a matter of trial and error you know yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it perhaps ends up in the end uh, to be a much longer route but then of course a person discovers certain things and uh, through uh, uh, observation I realized that um, you know as far as perspective is concerned uh, a person need to be very careful to use colors that are not too close to the primaries because um, I know this goes against the grain in modern art especially although the tendency lately is to go more towards black and white um, to be careful and then learn how to mix colors. And uh, I started, what fascinated me was always the cloud. I used to look at the uh, uh, old masters and, and, and see the clouds. And you know, cloud, clouds have direct lighting. They have reflected lighting in them. They have different degrees of translucency. And all this affects the light. So it was, to me, clouds were not just white things. They were they were very interesting things. They still are, and it's almost impossible to copy them. But then again, you know, the, uh, to paint clouds is uh, it's almost like for Enwa, he said, uh, you know, when he uh, when he wants to really relax, he paints flowers. Now, when I want to relax, I would paint clouds. And I would love the turbulence in the skies, especially here in South Africa. I don't know about your country. I've never been there. But we get the most beautiful uh, effects in, in, in our skies here. And uh, I can sit and lie on, on my back on the grass and just study the clouds. It's also very important that, that the person would do cloud studies where there's very little landscape or anything else but clouds on, on, on one's uh, canvas. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, certain people would, uh, a lot of people would actually just um, use 
a, a tiny variance of greys, uh, you know, cool and warm greys, and then uh, almost white, and almost white to depict clouds, and they never white. There's, there's always color there, and to make the colors pop, one needs the greys. Because if you don't get the greys right, you can't get the color right. And if you don't get the shadows right, you cannot depict light. So it is actually a bit of a, a, a you know, it's applicable actually to anything in life. With, without the dark on your canvas, you cannot have light popping out. So the dark parts of the canvas are very important. Uh, if once one has established that, then you can, of course, bring the light out of the picture. Right. So you're you're saying every people should study, do cloud studies, and and just do clouds, and and forget the rest of the landscape to really. Yes. Learn. Well, it's a, it's a, a look. You can apply it even to trees, and uh, uh, it all depends which side the, the light is coming from. The one side will be lit up and the other side will be dark. And if you have warm light, you'll usually have cool shadows. And if you have cool light, you'll have warmer shadows. So these are all just little facts that a person learn along the way. And uh, you learn how to implement them. And uh, uh, yes, that's it. Uh, you know, get the, get the light coming out of the cloud. Well, when, how, were, how old were you when you started working with the oil? Was that oh, when you got out of the clinic? No, no, I worked with it before, but uh, then I stopped. I had a stint I did in Swaziland. Look, I was very young, and I was actually, uh, when I was small, uh, people used to call me a child prodigy. Uh, with the music and uh, it didn't sit very well with me because uh, you know it my, my father was a very hard taskmaster master and he wouldn't accept you know for instance if you'd play a, a musical scale and one note is out of tune then it's not good enough simply not good enough so it was a very tough life in a sense as well and he was a very good teacher and uh, uh, he was a brilliant saxophonist and he could play just about any instrument. He was also a fairly, not good pianist, but he, he knew the keyboard very well. Right. But did you, you, um, you had at one point, because you, I know that you, you wanted, you knew you wanted to be a artist and a musician, but what, what was your strongest passion, would you say, was, because it sounded like you did the music for a while first, but then then you moved out of that into the art. Was your father, yes. was he pushing the music or? Yeah, look, my, my father was, uh, he, he pushed hard for the music because even as a musician in this country, it was almost impossible to make a living. So all musicians, had a had a permanent day job and they would do gigs and you know concerts and whatever at night and they would spend all their spare time practicing i was required even when i was in school to practice a minimum of four hours per day apart from everything else i had to do i had to practice for four hours and during the school holidays that became eight hours wow but you mentioned in when you and I met briefly on the Google chat, you you said to me that you finally let go of the music to focus on art. What? When? When was this exactly? Was that? Because it sounded like it wasn't that long ago that you that you really just decided just to do the art. Okay, that was in. Um Actually, I, I, I started doing that fairly seriously at the age of 27. Although I had been doing it for a while, you know, it was more a part-time kind of thing, although I was fairly serious about it. And um, it was when I uh, left the clinic that I felt that I needed to be, uh, you know, more with, more with myself than mm -hmm. 
Look, art and music is two completely different things as far as with, as an artist, the person is more of an introvert, whereas uh, as with uh, being a musician, you, you need to be an extrovert because you are performing in front of people and you actually need to entertain them. Whether you are playing in an orchestra or doing, uh, playing as part of a small band or as a soloist, you, you, one needs to entertain the people whether you're in the mood to do that or not. And uh, that was a bit of a conflict for me because I felt that with the art, it's a much more personal thing. Uh, people see your work afterwards, but uh, when you're busy creating it, then you you by yourself, you know. You do you do that as almost as a hermit. And uh, I suppose that was much closer to my nature because I enjoyed uh, doing things by myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that. I, I actually am like that myself and I'm, you know, I'm doing photography and I, I think the part I like about that is when I'm by myself doing, you know, obviously if I have a model, I'm not totally by myself, but if I'm photographing, you know, nature or animals or whatever. Um, so I know what you mean that, that if you're a bit of a loner, that does work a lot better than the music. I think. Yes, it does. And the person uh -huh. also... Uh, when you, yeah. Go ahead. When you're, when you're on your own, then, uh, you know, you have much more freedom to uh, to follow your mind and your feeling and whatever. Uh, as, with, as with music, you are... You, you do have the uh, possibilities of uh, uh, improvising and that sort of thing, but uh, you're always restricted because you are too doing this together with others. Exactly. And yeah, but you, I know, I know you're being modest, but you've been referred to as a master artist. How does that, when you hear that, because I know you've heard it a lot just with me promoting you, how does this move you or what, do you, what goes through your mind when you hear that? I hope it's good. <laughs> yeah, yes. Look, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I I think the older one gets, the the less convinced one probably is because uh, you know my and some of my artist friends, which are even older than I am, uh, our main objective is always to paint a better picture. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow I want to paint something better than today. So. Uh, it's fine, you know, for other people. We cannot, uh, for other people to call you whatever they like. I cannot stop them. And uh, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, it's fine. And I, I don't want to, to, to put people down if they give me a compliment. I must have the grace to, to accept the compliments. And, uh, but in my mind, of course, <laughs> I have a long way to go. <laughs> But that's good because we're, I mean, you're, I think even the term master artist, I mean, I think everybody, not, I mean, you're, you're going to always continue to grow and learn, but you've gotten to that level where you've achieved um, a certain amount of greatness in what you do that people really highly respect your work. And I think that's, I think you should enjoy being, I should enjoy that title <laughs> for sure. Well, well, look, it, it it does feel good. We, we played it <laughs> together as, as as a group, and uh, one of the younger artists is a very talented man. I don't want to name names yet, but a very talented guy, and uh, uh, he's he's a successful and well established artist. And we were painting out in the felt, and this guy came and stood in front of my canvas because sometimes I work very quick on a painting, especially if I'm doing plein air, and um, he's. He still looked at my canvas, you know, I thought his picture was beautiful and, uh, and, and excellent. And he stood in front of my canvas and he said, there's just something else here. There's something else I can't describe. And I looked at it, I said to him, what do you think it is? Can you tell me? I'd like to know. And he said to me, no, but I'm actually asking you, what, what? I said to him, maybe it's a couple of decades or 30 years or something. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> it, it, it is important to walk the road, to, to paint 
cover the canvas and do the mileage. You put the work in, you'll get somewhere. And it's the same with music. Uh, it's, it's very hard work. One needs to be very disciplined about it. And uh, accept, uh, of course, it's, it's a joy, especially when other artists give gives one good compliments. It, 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 it inspires one and it, it's a good motivation to carry on. And uh, I think it always helps to do tomorrow's picture a little bit better. Yeah. Well, you, you're highly admired in, by a lot of people and you, your work is just exquisite. And um, so you, I, you, you enjoy that title, whether you, <laughs> whether you think it's true or not. But I, I know you have workshops and I wanted to hear how teaching influences you as an artist because I can tell just by things that you post and stuff that you're very really passionate about your teaching. Yes, well, it keeps one on your toes. Look, uh, I would even say, uh, you know, to call myself a, a, a teacher, um, not really that I'm sharing that what, which I've learned and I'm trying to remove some of the obstacles and the mistakes that I, I used to make and show people the easiest way to get going and uh, to feel good about yourself and uh, your work and then uh, make faster progress. So that's all I do. I call it rather motivational than teaching classes. It's, I am trying to inspire people to when they've done with the workshops, they would go home and can't wait to tackle the canvas. The one thing we all need to get rid of is the fear of a white canvas. And that I can say with total conviction that I'm not scared of any canvas. Uh, I have kicked holes in, uh, in a few when I was younger. <laughs> and I was very, very happy with them. But uh, <laughs> yes, no, I have no fear for a white canvas because uh, it is my canvas, it's my paint, and it's going to be my work. So I can mess it up if I want. Well, you know, I read, I was reading something, and I cannot remember his name. He he was an ir he's an Irish painter, and I, uh, his name has escaped me right now. But he was it, the article I read about him. He was saying how often he goes he's when sometimes he's painting if he hate he if he loses himself and hate doesn't like what he's doing he he begins destroying the painting and he says but sometimes it's out of that destruction that he creates some of his best work you know so i thought that was an interesting you know interesting um a way of looking at what he did because he admitted that often he he would not like what he what he did and just begin to destroy it, but then it would turn yes. around and be something great. So it sounds like you've had those experiences. Yes, we call them happy accidents. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of one of the nicest things to do is to uh, you know, my palettes that I paint or mix my paint on, I always make new ones and they are properly primed. And so that when the paint on them is dried, I scrape off most of the thick paint that's left when I'm done with the painting and I put them one side and let them dry. Usually for around six months because that is considered a safe period to repaint over uh, oil uh, in order not to let it crack. So I would take those uh, boards or whatever they are and they're well primed that so you can do an artwork on them and I would see what's on them and let what happened and by mixing for the painting six months ago, I would sit and look at this and just stare at it and I would see something and then out of that create something. And even let some of the old paint show through, not cover it. Oh, and okay. Those, those are also really accidents and they definitely have become my best paintings. Wow. And so I, I always tell people an old canvas is worth gold. Don't, don't keep goals in them. Just keep them for a while and <laughs> paint something nice on them. <laughs>
Well, that's true. I mean, that's a good idea, actually. But um, I wanted, while we're on the subject of we were teaching, because I know I, this is a later question, but I'm going to ask it now, because how do you, I've always been curious, when you, when you are teaching, how do you keep, how do you keep your students from, I don't know, emulating what you're doing and develop their own style rather than trying to become who they're learning from or develop your style but develop their own? How do you, how do you sway them from, or is that even a problem? No, it, it, it usually just happens. I don't encourage anybody to paint uh, the way I do. I give them some of the pointers and, and, and material and uh, uh, approach, application, and a couple of tips. And if there's 12 of us painting one particular picture, not two of them will look the same. Uh, color mixes may end up the same because that's quite important. And uh, But as, as far as that's concerned, you know, more often than not, one would hear, oh no, I made a total mess of this. And this is people. And then I stop them and I say, I don't want to hear any negative comment <laughs> by, by, by anyone here. As long as your mess doesn't look like mine, that's fine. <laughs> and then I would, I would go look, I would go look at each one's work and and find something that, you know, they they really got right. And perhaps that's not what I showed them, but it gives them confidence. And I show them you can use that what happened on your canvas as a happy accident and work around that. Make that your focal point. So uh, I always encourage people, find your own material and, uh, you know, your subject material and then uh, try and do your own thing. But there are certain rules which you can follow until you're, you're uh, confident enough to start breaking those. Right, that's good advice. I, I, it really is. I want to. I want to quote you on this because I re, there was a beautiful quote that you had made, and I wanted to read it. You you said, uh, "Create with a brave heart. Let no one discourage you. For what is wisdom to one is stupidity to another. We all are all on a journey, and we will never know how." will get before time runs out we may miss all the joy and beauty along the way having focused on only on a goal we may never reach was this inspired by something you were going through at the time personally or, or just from an, a life's lesson or because I thought that was a very beautiful quote yeah I look it's uh, it's from my own life experiences obviously also from uh, 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 things that happen to me and then also experiencing you know uh, the feelings and the difficulties and the struggle of a lot of different artists uh, which you know even on, on on the internet and on Facebook and even uh, through personal contact with, with some of the uh, artists one picks up you know a friend of mine he phoned me one night and he said he's about 15 years older than I am and he, he really is a master artist I would call him that and uh, of course he, he, he'll give me one on the ear for that, but uh, it's fine. <laughs> and he found me and he said, I think I've lost all my skills. And I said to him, but don't we all feel like that at least once a week? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's what happens, you see. So, uh, And that's what uh, actually inspired me to write that piece and post it and share it with people so that, you know, we must know... Uh, Never look down on anybody. There are people, you know, that would uh, like to shove different artists into different categories and look down on them. And uh, there are some people that, that are ridiculed. We had a guy here who coined the phrase, I'm laughing all the way to the bank. Now, he's passed away some years ago and it was, was Trichikov. I think he was a Russian born painter and he did stuff which people call kitsch and yet the only thing he said I'm laughing all the way to the bank and he was <laughs> quite an interesting character and even today in today's art world yeah it, I mean it's 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 fairly nice to say I think the guy was a very good artist and he chose to do certain things because he probably 
wanted to have his work displayed. You know, I mean, that is what happens. We all, you hang a piece of your soul on someone's wall and people start criticizing you. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and at any given time, I have a couple of, or even more artist friends that are having some kind of treatment or going through some kind of difficulty. And I understand those things because I've been there myself. And uh, I think it's always necessary to encourage people, even if you think what they're doing is not really nice. Because they've, they're trying to do something and why stop them? I yeah. don't encourage, yeah. I encourage, like for instance, when you see people going on, um, on this idol show, shows all over the world, uh, someone ends up on stage because the grandmother told them they have a beautiful voice and in fact, the, <laughs> the, in fact, the poor kid is stone deaf. So I, I do believe in a certain amount of honesty because, you know, if... <laughs> but I do. <laughs> if, so, so the grandmother didn't do the poor kid any favor by telling him that. So <laughs> I, I do believe that a person needs to be honest to a certain extent. And, and that is fine. There may be a lot of people that regard my artist sketch or whatever, but it doesn't matter to me. It's my journey and I've started it. And I think most people have realized by now that I'm not going to go away. I'm yet to stay. Wow. You've been through a lot and I, 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 want, I wanted to get back to because you talked about it a little, but I wanted you to expand on a little bit because I wanted you to share about your the moment about your sobriety and how becoming sober affected your work as an artist, but as well as a human being. Because I know you're very, um, you were very open about it, and um, I can relate to you because. As a recovered alcoholic myself, I know the pains of, of making the resolve, but I also know the rewards of, of sobriety, and and it, and it takes time too. I think so many people think when they make a change, things are going to happen overnight, and I know you know as well that it doesn't. But how did it affect you when you? when you made that commitment and you went to that clinic and then you came out, how did it affect your work as an artist and just as a human being? Well, of course, there was a, a huge difference. Um, the little story, you know, I always say to people, uh, I could never sleep without having a, not just a drink, having a bottle or two. And <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't sleep without it. In the end, of course, it's a, it's a terrible uh, addiction, and um, I remember that at first, when some friends were talking to me and trying to convince me to go to a rehab, I I saw no point in it. I was really at the at, at the end of my tether. You know, I, I I didn't see any light. There was only black, and it was like a tunnel. Really, I think you would know exactly what I'm talking about. I couldn't see any way forward or sideways or even to turn around. There was nothing. And uh, a good friend of mine, unfortunately, he died in an accident uh, last year. Uh, he was younger than I was and he said to me, okay, if you, where you are, you say you are, then um, why not give it a try? You've got nothing to lose. And that's what actually touched me. And I thought to myself, I have small children, I have a wonderful wife, so let me let me go and just see maybe all the trouble I've caused and made and the bad situations that I've ended up in, maybe it maybe it it's not the end, you know. So I went and for three days I didn't sleep, of course, in the clinic. I was battling to eat, I was fighting with the staff. And I was not a, not a very easy guy. And then the one night I I thought I saw a, a nurse, but it very old, very old uh, uniform, you know, that was probably before the Second World War uniform. <laughs> and I said to her, you know, would you 
would you mind, you know, just to come sit next to my bed and read me something, even if it's from the Bible, you know, just read me something. And she said to me, well, we're not really allowed to do that, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm coming, you go to bed so long. Now, I woke up the next morning, I don't remember anything, I don't know if anybody came into my room and read anything to me or whatever, I just know, <coughs> pardon me, I, I woke up and I was euphoric. And I ran down the stairs and into the dining room and everybody had learned to know me as a grumpy old dangerous guy, you know, that's not very happy to be here. And I ran in and I shouted to them, I slept, I slept. You know, as if that's now winning a marathon or, or gold medal at the Olympics. I slept. And I was in that euphoric state for quite a few days. I even wanted to climb in a tree just because I could. And, you know, some people may find this funny, but this experience, or call it what you like, dream, it was very real to me. And I still remember that as if it was yesterday. And that was when my life changed and when I came, I decided there is no problem too big. The only point is I am not in charge. I realized when I try to be in charge of everything or think I am in charge of everything, then I mess things up. I can screw them up quite badly, I can promise you that. And uh, I realized that, you know, as we are taught in certain um, at certain institutions that they you know you know, there is someone bigger or greater than yourself now of course i'm a christian and um, i believe that uh, god changed my life to others uh, they may believe in something else but i think it's that kind of humility that we get to a certain point and lose pride which is a very dangerous thing and then to realize that I need, there are certain things which I cannot control. I have no control over that and I need to let those things go. And then it became easier. Of course, it had, had an effect on, on, on everything in my life, my relationships, my work. And uh, 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 some people used to look at me in wonder, you know, and I kept telling them it's, it's a miracle, you know, this, uh, I mean, if you believe in miracles or not, what happened to me, I believe is a miracle. Now, I stayed sober for, maybe I should not even mention it, but it was 25 years. And wow. then, then six, six or seven years ago, I, for some reason, just ended up in my car somewhere with a bottle of uh, alcohol, and it nearly killed me. I know the percentage for recovery after being sober for so long is almost no, zero. And so I got another chance. And when I got through that, then uh, everything really exploded then. Then, uh, you know, everything grew and it, it became so much more magnified because my focus was so much stronger. And I suppose that's what one learns from these kind of, kind of things. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, you know, I'll... Our lives are not perfect, and there's good things that happen us, to us every day, and there's also bad things that happen to us. But the bad things, as long as they can make us stronger in our beliefs and in our uh, need and our joy and our passions, then we've learned from those. I believe that if one doesn't learn from mistakes, then they will come back again one will be taught the lesson until you've learned it. Exactly. I believe that too. Well, you've overcome a lot, and I think that's, um, I think it's great because I know on your website you're, you're passionate about helping people with addictions. And, you know, they typically run, I mean, they're in any industry, but they do typically run, seem seemingly to run in very creative people. So, I, I wanted you, I knew you would be comfortable about sharing that today and I'm glad that you did because I think it can help so many people, um, you know, who are suffering those types of problems. But there, there is life after, after recovery. <laughs> oh yes, of course, yes. 
a much better the, life. <laughs> yeah, swap the bottle for a brush, or even for a nice garden. Make your own nice garden. That's being creative, yeah. and there's 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 a lot of. Uh, 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 joy that one can get from creating any small thing or making your own little garden on your stoop, knitting things, just be creative, learn to use your hands and I think, you know, especially in uh, the world we're living in with electronics, if one looks like today I was spending a lot of time waiting for my car to be fixed and I looked at the people, you know, and even when one walking down the street, you've got to be careful not to be bumped over by someone who's so uh, uh, absorbed by the cell phone that they don't realize there's a life going on around them. There's, there are other people. We don't yeah. see these things, and it's quite unfortunate. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about that the other day. I was thinking how, I, because I was actually... Um, I, oh, I was walking through a, a beautiful park, a bo it's called a bog garden here, and there was a guy ahead of me, and I was with my dogs going through the woods, and this guy was walking through the woods too, And but he had his face in the cell phone the whole time, and I was thinking, how can he appreciate any of this beauty when he's like like this on the cell phone? And it, and it was, it was kind of sad. I, I, I was like, this is not the way it should be, <laughs> but no, I I believe that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but what what would you say is your most proud moment or accomplishment? Because I know your art is now all over the world, but there, you know, you never know what someone's most proud moment is. Sometimes it's not what we think it would be, or yes, you know, uh, it's it's actually. Uh, it wasn't a gallery or some big art collector or anything like that. I became friends with one of the uh, one of the top dealers and 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 art critics. Is uh, he died many years ago. We became best friends and we spent a lot of time together. Uh, we were uh, closer than even family. You know, it, it, he was my mentor and, and all sorts of things. And he took my work all over the world, even before it ever appeared in a gallery in South Africa. So uh, there was some confusion as to when my work first uh, appeared in galleries. Yeah, people were asking, why is this guy's work so expensive? Who does he think he is? And I all sorts of funny comments. In meanwhile, <laughs> my friend had been taking it all over the world. And uh, he said to me the one day uh, I was going to Cape Town and he said to me I need to go to Weinberg. Now Weinberg used to be a very arty place and one of my uh, uh, art uh, heroes, uh, local guys, Alexander Rosinas, he lived in Weinberg and he had a beautiful old thatched roof house there. And in the same street there was a restaurant. It was. Uh, uh, it had an Italian name, but it was run by a Greek friends of this Italian friend of mine. And he said to me, I need to visit them because uh, they want to meet me and they want to they want to treat me a bit, you know. And uh, my wife and I went, I found them and they said, please come over for lunch. And it's nearby the Weinberg Court. And we walked in there and I saw... Uh, a lot of my very early paintings, which I didn't really want to sell, but which Enzo took from me, my friend. And uh, the entire restaurant, the walls were covered in my paintings, and they were framed. I was, I was, I was floored. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And even though they were at that stage, my paintings were very dark. Uh, they really was part of the atmosphere and these people treated us like kings you know that uh, it was it was probably one of the nicest moments ever wow when, when i saw this yeah. that would be that's a good story that would be um, that had to be very emotional it would have been for me <laughs> so yes uh, look of course you walk into any place and of course then also, the first time I walked into a gallery, uh, I was a hermit for most of my life, uh, as far as the, the art's concerned. And I walked into a gallery and uh, 
there was a little picture standing there and it was bubble wrapped and it was in quite a beautiful frame but through the bubble wrapping I could see it's my painting <laughs> it was one of the farm workers where I was renting a place at the time and he was a very proud guy always very upright and he was pushing a wheelbarrow and I saw this little picture and I didn't know these galleries and I didn't know the lady I just met her and I said to her where did you get my picture <laughs> you know and she said to me oh boy is that your painting won't you please sit down I need to get you some coffee and what <laughs> would you like to drink and I will talk to you and uh, uh, yes that was also a very happy moment wow. when I when I saw the picture there and I realized that a lot of the local collectors also have uh, quite a large collection of my works Wow well that that had to feel wonderful and I, I, I would have been very <laughs> excited <laughs> so I think that's really great that's that's a good memory good moment. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, Coos, as an artist, because how did you become so fascinated with landscapes and arbor scenes, as, as well as street scenes, too? What, what was it that inspired you so much about that versus painting people, I guess? You know, um, there's, there's quite a few of the old masters, South African old masters that have passed away, all of them, of course. And uh, uh, there was a place in Cape Town called District Six. Now, this was a place where the, it it was was a it was a little like a little cosmopolitan city. There was uh, all kinds, you know, and even with the political situation at the time in the country, uh, uh, a name that everyone came to hate, apartheid. And District Six was one of of the places that became known uh, fairly well all over the world because these artists painted the buildings and they were the most beautiful buildings and uh, such a mixture of cultures and races and uh, you know different types of food it was really one of you know to an artist probably one of the most beautiful places in the world and this place was destroyed. People were forcibly removed, and this place was destroyed. I have some photos, and I have uh, I have even painted some scenes of uh, you know using the the photographs that that was collected, and uh, that that fascinated me. And then later on, of course, uh, uh, what inspired me in the first place were the artists that used to paint it, and the way they depicted it was just to me it was 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 something very special. So I've, I've always been fascinated since then by buildings, be they simple or uh, uh, very ornate or elaborate. And uh, of course, the way the light falls on it. And then mm -hmm. the people that are around. Yeah. Yeah, well, I have some some years here, and I thought I actually thought I had the, there was one of some buildings that you did that I really like, and I did I, I thought I had it on here, but I don't. But I've got some of your um, a lot of your arbor scenes, and then this is a landscape. Yes, I think the one one you had before on one of the ads you put up was 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 a scene from this district. I have photos and uh, of course a lot of artists paint it nowadays but uh, people don't really know what it looked like there and uh, I actually should have had the photographs with me but I don't and uh, yeah it was uh, of the uh, buildings you know in different stages of demolition yeah and uh, and it is still a sore point today you know even to myself as uh, part of I suppose the Afrikaner community and uh, uh, it to me that was a sad, a very sad part of our history because uh, I would have loved to go and still sit there today and paint. Wow, wow. But I know you mostly do the plain air painting, right? Mostly or? Not really, you know. Um, 
No, it is sometimes a huge effort to to get out, and uh, okay. I really I really enjoy it, and it's probably the best thing one can do is to paint plain air. But then, of course, like probably most artists, my uh, a, a lot of my work is studio work. I yes, I would go, I would go and take photos and make little sketches, do oil sketches, or do a small picture. And then later on, use that same scene and and do a studio work that's really planned very well. Right. Did you want to show that one that you have? It was a one that's still drying, I think. Yeah. Unfortunately, I had a large number of paintings here, but they've all been sold. The lighting is also not very good here, but uh, this one is in fact. Uh, I was so busy and I was distracted by so many things that I couldn't get back to the painting. That's so, okay. Yeah, yesterday I sat down and I took this canvas and uh, I just pushed paint around on it and I felt really happy after that because when I think you'd know when you don't get around to your photography, mm -hmm. a person can get to feel quite sick. So, <laughs> I get grumpy. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, the lighting not so good yeah that's good even, if that's you can good. see the color that's good. yeah like keep, also, keep talking so it, the camera will stay on you okay okay yeah, I see. all right and i think in the picture you can see that the the light the light that's falling on the landscape it would not look impressive without the dark trees on the left that's another trick I use, or not a trick, it's just a, a L-shaped composition and uh, one of the sides of the painting is very dark, which anchors the painting and it makes it uh, quite a bit easier to uh, uh, tweak on perspective and uh, composition. So that it's always uh, a good thing to add that you have a dark foreground, you can have the light. Without the dark, you cannot see the light. Exactly, and the, the, the sky there is gorgeous, the skyline that you did. No, thank you. Now, it would not look like that if I didn't have the dock. On it, it wouldn't. No, yeah. I can see that. Yeah, so if I take the dock away, it would not work. And then the colors become richer as they come forward. Of course, the funny thing about the skies is that the further the clouds are away from you, it goes completely against the rules uh, the warmer the clouds get. And usually any object or scene in the landscape, the further away the cooler it gets. And yet with clouds that one is reversed. If one does not reverse it, it just doesn't seem right. So that is a bit of a controversial thing I would say, but uh, it's just one of the things that I've observed. Uh, painting landscapes. Wow, that's that's gorgeous. That's beautiful. Thank you. That is. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I just got a couple more questions for you here, if you got time. Yes, it's fine. Um, let's see which one was I wanted to. Oh, well, yeah, I did want to ask you, because your bio says you ignored trends and spent a lot of time in isolation, avoiding the larger art community. How did how did that help you as an artist, do you feel? I think it helped me in, in the sense that, that I was not uh, quite as much influenced and uh, probably also, uh, you know, a matter of a, a bit of, self-protection because uh, you know criticism can be very harsh and uh, one doesn't always need negative things uh, good uh, constructive criticism is a very good thing and I think I was quite uh, protecting myself a bit I was also uh, like most artists we we don't really consider ourselves uh, uh, nearly as good as some people say we are and uh, uh, I think it's just one of those things. Um, I've learned not to try and stand too high up on the ladder in my own mind because the fall is so much further and 
order. So, so <laughs> I suppose it was, was, was also a measurement of, of protecting myself. And it worked well for me. I think in the art world, anywhere in the world, probably uh, even with the uh, electronic media available today, one's best advert is word of mouth and having your work in good collections. So I think that's someone, something every artist needs to keep in mind and keep working at. Um, first to those closer to you and then widen the circle slowly and eventually you will you will develop well enough so that people will start taking notice and you'll get your work into more important collections. That's good. I think that makes a lot of sense. So kind of develop yourself and move into the larger scene gradually. So that, I think that's, I mean, that, that would work for me, I think. Um, yeah. Because people, yeah. people are, people can be very critical, <laughs> not always in a good way. So it's, you know, it's now, the other thing is, of course, pe people don't always know what we want to do and yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, w what we're trying to achieve. And if you employ maybe uh, certain techniques or approaches that, that may not be right in their mind, it's okay for me because I can develop, you know, and uh, that's, that's all I'm after to make a progress. You know, Pablo Casals was one that probably uh, regarded as uh, the best uh, cellist in the world ever and uh, I watched an interview with him uh, on, on television and uh, he was in his 90s and they asked him what does he do with his days and most of his days were were taken up still by practicing on his cello and the bloke said to him well why do you practice so much you in your 90s you probably the world best ever and will ever see you know nobody will ever reach you probably and he said i do it because i'm making progress <laughs> and i i think that's a very good reason to keep on and spend time with it that's great that is good well that's good i'm glad you shared that but i think it is you're we're always growing and and there's always something new to learn i think no matter what level we get to there's always going to be something even if it's something small that something yes. small something small can inspire you to to mm. something new but um but i wanted is, is there what what is there any other advice you would give coos to an inspiring artist uh, other than what you just said as well as a or even a seasoned artist you know that yes um uh, yes uh you know, uh, just keep at it and enjoy it while you're doing it. Stop being too critical of yourself. And as long as you, you learn something new every time you do or do something better than you did previously, then, you know, take that and uh, use it. But most of all, you know, be passionate about it and enjoy what you're doing because uh, as I, you mentioned in that little quote, uh, you know, we we don't know how long our journey will last and we will get to. So there's no point in creating these things if we don't have a passion and enjoy it. Well, that's good advice. I think you're right. You've got to enjoy kind of the moment, be in the moment, and enjoy it and do what you're passionate yes. about. Of course. It's like you with the photographs. If you... If you happen, you won't take, every time you take a photo, it's not going to be a very good one. Uh, you won't be happy with all of them, but uh, soon, every now and again, you get a picture that, that really wows you, you know, and then that's, that's the strong building stones. The ones that we're not so happy with, they're still building stones. They may be smaller, but they're still part of our journey. Yeah, well, um, that is so right in fact i was yesterday i photographed or day before yesterday i think it was or photographed um one of the artists on my show last year and i'm somehow i'm going to photograph you I, my goal is to photograph everybody and she's local here and i was having one of those days like you were talking about earlier where things weren't going i mean i you know we have these days where we feel all of a sudden we feel like we forgot everything but 
she was so patient and I was so excited about photographing her um, <laughs> painting. She was actually, I, I didn't even realize that she was actually painting a, a painting there. I thought she was just acting so I could photograph her. And then she had this, <laughs> she had this beautiful little painting, but I stuck with it. And um, in the end, I guess my point was, that I got some really beautiful photos of her and I was really excited, but I just remember when we got started, I was like, well, I'm not, I was feeling all thumbs. I was having one of those days and I thought, this is not a good time for this to happen. But then, <laughs> then when I saw the end result, you know, I was like very pleased. So you're right. You just have to stick with things and, and sometimes you're going to have good things come out of disasters. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So to speak. Keep, keep, keep at it. Yeah. Keep at it, Joe. Yeah. Well, I I just have am thrilled that you were here today, and I'm gonna um make sure that I get a lot of your beautiful paintings in my blog article as well, Coos. And um, is there a the art the is the best way to for people to see your work on Facebook? Is that the best? Yes, they all work uh, in galleries. Uh, and in galleries, yeah. Yeah, in galleries, but then I usually share it with people on Facebook, not because I want to brag or anything like that. It's just that it's a part of me and I'd like to share it with people, you know. And uh, uh, some of them are good, some of them are not so good, but uh, that's how it is. Uh, it's always good to post pictures and show people, and especially if I hear from other artists that you're making pro progress. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's an elderly artist, uh, a lady artist, uh, she's, she's actually a brilliant artist and she's the daughter of one of our famous uh, local sculptors and uh, she sent me a message the one day, I'm watching you, you're getting better <laughs> and better. And do, do, you, do, do you know it is like somebody has slapped a jet back to my back? <laughs> and I went sky high <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, there's no encouragement better than that. Right. That that is that is great. That is great. Well, I want to thank you again for being here today, Coos. Was there anything you wanted to add that we didn't cover or mention, or or an upcoming ex ex exhibition, or anything that you wanted to mention uh, that we? Yeah, I've got. Uh, I've always had exhibitions and workshops which I advertise on Facebook, and uh, um, uh, there's also group exhibitions that I take part in. But uh, uh, I'm always busy with one or the other project, and I've decided to scale down a bit on those because it, you know, it keeps me away from my my uh, easel, and I don't like that. I would, uh, as I get older, I like to be more in front of my easel. And spend time with my grandchildren, which uh, which are both learning to paint, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. I saw one of your a painting. I guess it was one of your grandchildren. I I can't. Was it a little boy? I think. Yes, it's, it's Dominic. Yeah, Dominic. Dominic he's, yes. Yeah, he's he's eight years old, and he's he's in fact sold some paintings. Uh, he's made some more, and he's even got uh, very good comments from some. Uh, top local artists and uh, I'm protecting him a bit now and I'm keeping some of his work uh, you know until a later date he's very young still and uh, uh, he's, he gets good pocket money now and again and I would <laughs> rather you know I would rather give him good pocket money than sell his paintings I'd rather keep them yeah or, or let, let him keep him, them for himself yeah, exactly. But there be I saw some really good ones, so I was impressed. So. Yeah, he has, he has no fear of the paint and the canvas, and children are mostly like that. Unfortunately, the uh, the older we get, uh, you know, <laughs> once we once we call ourselves grown ups, we've developed all kind of fears, and uh, <laughs> we get messed up. <laughs> and uh, no, we, get, we get messed up. We should stay like children. You know, and we create <laughs> I know, I know. Well, I want to thank you again for being here so much, Coos. I've really had fun talking to you. You're such a, such a good 
good guy, you know, anyway. <laughs> and I love, <laughs> I love all your little inspirational things on your Facebook page, too. So that's good that you're encouraging uh, people. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I hope that uh, uh, if anybody was watching it that day, maybe picked up one or two tips it was nice talking to you it's just like talking to an old friend and uh, all the best with your uh, 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 photography and also your uh, your struggle yeah thank you thank you very much thank you and i know i know on there i'm gonna put all your links in the blog so i'll make sure i get all that from you anything that you want me to use so that people will know how to reach you and they'll also be at the end of the bit uh, youtube video so so there'll be yes. pl plenty of ways for people to find you but um but i want to thank the viewers for their continued support you're going to be able to see the replay of this this interview on my youtube channel it'll also be on i'll be sharing it all over social media facebook twitter all those sites um it'll be on my cinderella story page uh, Cinderella Story YouTube channel, and it'll be at my blog at TamarasCloset.com, and that's where I'll put some of um, Goose's links to his social media pages, and um, he's also on the Arts and Artists, I think it is, website. Well, I'll have that in there, um, yeah. and yeah, and I think you can see most of his work on Facebook, unless you're, you know, can get to a gallery that where his work is. And I, so I have all of those links um, for um, YouTube and in my blog. But join me next Friday as I interview a magnificent and young pianist from Rome, uh, Francesco Tascali. And he's cute as pie. He's really, really young. He's cute. He's got that Italian accent. So that'll be fun. And to my viewers, to your own success, you keep on rocking. I'll see you next week. And take care. Bye.